Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter seventy seven. I stumbled upon one curious character in the island of Mani. He became a sore annoyance to me in the course of time. My first glimpse of him was in a sort of public room in the town of Lahaina. He occupied a chair at the opposite side of the apartment, and sat eyeing our party with interest for some minutes, and listening as critically to what we were saying as if he fancied we were talking to him and expecting him to reply. I thought it very sociable in a stranger. Presently, in the course of conversation, I made a statement bearing upon the subject under discussion, and I made it with due modesty, for there was nothing extraordinary about it, and it was only put forth in illustration of a point at issue. I had barely finished when this person spoke out with rapid utterance and feverish anxiety. Oh, that was certainly remarkable, after a fashion, but you ought to have seen my chimney. You ought to have seen my chimney, sir. Smoke? I wish I may hang if— uh, Mr. Jones, you remember that chimney? You must remember that chimney. No, no, I, I recollect now. You weren't living on this side of the island, then. But I am telling you nothing but the truth, and I wish I may never draw another breath if that chimney didn't smoke, so that the smoke actually got caked in it, and I had to dig it out with a pickaxe. You may smile, gentlemen, but the high sheriff's got a hunk of it which I dug out before his eyes, and so it's perfectly easy for you to go and examine for yourselves." The interruption broke up the conversation, which had already begun to lag, and we presently hired some natives and an outrigger canoe or two, and went out to overlook a grand surf-bathing contest. Two weeks after this, while talking in a company, I looked up and detected this same man boring through and through me with his intense eye, and noted again his twitching muscles and his feverish anxiety to speak. The moment I paused, he said, "'Beg your pardon, sir, beg your pardon, but it can only be considered remarkable when brought into strong outline by isolation. Sir, contrasted with a circumstance which occurred in my own experience, it instantly becomes commonplace.' No, not that, for I will not speak so discourteously of any experience in the career of a stranger and a gentleman, but I am obliged to say that you could not, and you would not ever again refer to this tree as a large one if you could behold, as I have, the great Yakmatak tree in the island of Onaska, Sea of Kamchatka, a tree, sir, not one inch less than four hundred and fifteen feet in solid diameter and I wish I may die in a minute if it isn't so. Oh, you needn't look so questioning, gentlemen. Here's old Captain Saltmarsh can say whether I know what I am talking about or not. I showed him the tree. Captain Saltmarsh. Come now, cat your anchor, lad. You're heaving too taut. You promised to show me that stunner, and I walked more than eleven mile with you through the cussedest jungle I ever see, a hunting for it. But the tree you showed me finally warn't as big round as a beer cask, and you know that your own self, Marcus. Hear the man talk? Of course the tree was reduced that way, but didn't I explain it? Answer me, didn't I? Didn't I say I wished you could have seen it when I first saw it? When you got up on your ear and called me names and said I had brought you eleven miles to look at a sapling, didn't I explain to you that all the whale ships in North Seas had been wooding off of it for more than twenty-seven years? And didn't you suppose the tree could last forever, confound it? I don't see why you want to keep back things that way, and try to injure a person that's never done you any harm." Somehow this man's presence made me uncomfortable, and I was glad when a native arrived at that moment to say that Makawao, the most companionable and luxurious among the rude war-chiefs of the islands, desired us to come over and help him enjoy a missionary whom he had found trespassing on his grounds. I think it was about ten days afterward that, as I finished a statement I was making for the instruction of a group of friends and acquaintances, and which made no pretense of being extraordinary, a familiar voice chimed instantly in on the heels of my last word, and said, "'But, my dear sir, there was nothing remarkable about that horse, or the circumstance either. Nothing in the world. I mean no sort of offence when I say it, sir, but you really do not know anything whatever about speed.' Bless your heart, if you could only have seen my mare Margareta, there was a beast. There was lightning for you. Trot. Trot is no name for it. She flew. How she could whirl a buggy along. I started her out, sir. Uh, Colonel Bilgewater, you recollect that animal perfectly well. 
I started her out about thirty or thirty-five yards ahead of the awfulest storm I ever saw in my life, and it chased us upwards of eighteen miles. It did by the everlasting hills. And I'm telling you nothing but the unvarnished truth when I say that not one single drop of rain fell on me. Not a single drop, sir, and I swear to it. But my dog was a-swimming behind the wagon all the way. For a week or two I stayed mostly within doors, for I seemed to meet this person everywhere, and he had become utterly hateful to me. But one evening I dropped in on Captain Perkins and his friends, and we had a sociable time. About ten o'clock I chanced to be talking about a merchant friend of mine, and without really intending it the remark slipped out that he was a little mean and parsimonious about paying his workmen. Instantly, through the steam of a hot whiskey punch, on the opposite side of the room, a remembered voice shot, and for a moment I trembled on the imminent verge of profanity. "'Oh, my dear sir, really you expose yourself when you parade that as a surprising circumstance. Bless your heart and hide, you are ignorant of the very A, B, C of meanness. Ignorant as the unborn babe. Ignorant as unborn twins. You don't know anything about it. It is pitiable to see you, sir, a well-spoken and prepossessing stranger, making such an enormous pow-wow here about a subject concerning which your ignorance is perfectly humiliating. Uh, look me in the eye, if you please. Look me in the eye. John James Godfrey was the son of poor but honest parents in the state of Mississippi, a boyhood friend of mine, bosom comrade in later years. Heaven rest his noble spirit, he is gone from us now. John James Godfrey was hired by the Hay Blossom Mining Company of California to do some blasting for them. The Incorporated Company of Mean Men, the boys used to call it. Well, one day he drilled a hole about four feet deep and put in an awful blast of powder, and was standing over it ramming it down with an iron crowbar about nine feet long, when the cussed thing struck a spark and fired the powder and scat! Away John Godfrey whizzed like a skyrocket. Him and his crowbar. Well, sir, he kept on going up in the air higher and higher till he didn't look any bigger than a boy, and he kept going on up higher and higher till he didn't look any bigger than a doll, and he kept on going up higher and higher till he didn't look any bigger than a little small bee, and then he went out of sight. Presently he came in sight again, looking like a little small bee, and he came along down further and further till he looked as big as a doll again, and down further and further till he was as big as a boy again, and further and further till he was a full-sized man once more, and then him and his crowbar came a whizzin' down and lit right exactly in the same old tracks, and went to rammin' down and rammin' down and rammin' down again, just the same as if nothing had happened. Now, do you know that poor cuss warn't gone only sixteen minutes, and yet that incorporated company of mean men docked him for the lost time. I said I had the headache, and so excused myself and went home. And on my diary I entered, Another night spoiled by this offensive loafer. And a fervent curse was set down with it to keep the item company. And the very next day I packed up, out of all patience, and left the island. Almost from the very beginning I regarded that man as a liar. The line of points represents an interval of years at the end of which time the opinion hazarded in that last sentence came to be gratifyingly and remarkably endorsed, and by wholly disinterested persons. The man, Marcus, was found one morning hanging to a beam of his own bedroom, the doors and windows securely fastened on the inside, dead, and on his breast was pinned a paper in his own handwriting begging his friends to suspect no innocent person of having anything to do with his death for that it was the work of his own hands entirely. Yet the jury brought in the astounding verdict that deceased came to his death by the hands of some person or persons unknown. They explained that the perfectly undeviating consistency of Marcus's character for thirty years towered aloft as colossal and indestructible testimony that whatever statement he chose to make was entitled to instant and unquestioning acceptance as a lie, and they furthermore stated their belief that he was not dead, and instanced the strong circumstantial evidence of his own word that he was dead, and beseeched the coroner to delay the funeral as long as possible, which was done. And so, in the tropical climate of Lahaina, the coffin stood open for seven days, and then even the loyal jury gave him up. But they sat on him again, 
and changed their verdict to suicide induced by mental aberration, because, they said, with penetration, he said he was dead, and he was dead, and would he have told the truth if he had been in his right mind? No, sir. End of chapter 77